Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Keenan Lafferty, and today is December 3rd, 2013, and this is the Kane Keel Show, episode 132, where we learn to be better artists. And today we are going to be jumping into how to make animated storyboards in Photoshop. Yes, that is right. I'm going to be teaching you guys how to do stuff like this in your very own home. This is some freelance work that I have been working on for a game called Pauldron. And it features knights in shining armor, dragons breathing fire, and this uh, creepy bearded guy stealing eggs or something like that. Which is pretty freaking sweet. The story is a lot deeper than that. I, I don't do it justice. But before we get into the tutorial and how we're going to be going about doing that, we need to take a stroll down the lovely lane to say thank you to everyone who has been submitting their amazing artwork to the page this week. And for those of you who have not yet come out of your shells, wanted to post anything on here, please do so if you're watching this on YouTube. Simply click the link down below and it'll take you to Facebook. I love that Emma Thresh. I want to see some more like Emma League of Legends characters. I'll probably do one myself. Uh, I really like this uh, governor from Walking Dead too. And then the, this reminded me of buttons. I was like, oh, that's so cute. And I like the cast shadow of the antlers going across the, the face there. So good job, Diego. And good job to everybody. Thank you once again for submitting. With all that out of the way, um, a couple more things. Actually, with that out of the way, a couple more things. Uh, a, the latest page of Emma released yesterday, so go read it! Go read it! And Twitter, if you're not following me on Twitter, please follow, because I'll update you when I'm sending out new videos. Okay, it's enough of that crap. Let's go ahead and get into the meat and potatoes. Alright, and I truly, truly hope that the driver is working for this thing. And it is! Brilliant! Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I need to teach you guys how we're going to do this. How do you make animated storyboards? And how did you even, like, I didn't really even know that you could do this until, I mean, I, I work a lot in After Effects, and that's also another Adobe program. And there's this little, um, there's this little toolbar right here that's called Animation. And also, one of my old coworkers, Larry Ray, used to use this thing right here. And basically what it allows you to do is, you'll notice a lot of these animations, they all just have to do with, I mean, you can't have a character like dancing necessarily, but um, a lot of these frames just have to do with movement and parallax. And I think that's what I'm going to be kind of focusing in on today for you guys. That's what I want to focus on today. So, um, first of all, let's, let's just go ahead and take a look at the, the assets that make up each scene. Let's go ahead and zoom in on this uh, bad boy here. Okay, so you'll notice, I want you guys to look at each of these scenes and, and tell me what is the same about each of them, right? And again, it's just these parallaxing layers. That's, that's basically all it is. And so asset one would be our little, our pauldron here, the shoulder piece. And then asset two is actually going to be, uh, this is Marcus back here. And I'll actually uh, de destruct or deconstruct these as we go. Okay, so let's see. We are on, what frame is this? This is, this is probably just going to be frame one. Okay, so yeah, let me just go ahead and deconstruct these scenes for you, and I can show you exactly how they work. Okay, so the first thing that you work with is a frame mask, right? Because check it out. If you take off the frame mask, look at how all of the assets sit outside of it. See how the background is actually like sitting there? You can actually watch the background and all of the assets like move across each other. And then what the frame mask does is it basically like trims everything away so that way it only exists within that one piece of, of the frame. Okay, so the first thing I want you guys to do, I guess, um, when like a good mindset to have when you're going to be creating an animation like this is create your assets so that, that way they're big, right? And you got to create the background, right? Because see how Marcus is moving in front of this background? You got to create the background. Okay, so anyway, let's continue with uh, deconstructing this. So let's take away the pauldron. See what we see behind the pauldron. See, it's just the table and then Marcus right there. Okay, and then you can see him moving like that. So take away Marcus, and then we see just that's the background. That's the background as it parallaxes. And it's actually going the other way. And this is this might be a little bit more of like an advanced technique or just something. But like the reason why, because you'll notice everything in the panel, everything here is moving from uh, right to left right to left. I have to do that backwards, so that's really weird for me to say right to left. But, however, the background is moving from left to right. 
And the reason why that's doing that is it, it's simulating um, not only just a pan of the camera, but a slight like tilting of the camera. And if you notice, like if you if you're sitting in a swivel chair, like look straight forward, and as you turn to the right, see how the the background or the the wall will move to the left. Isn't that interesting? So um, yeah, turn to the right. Oh, man, that's really hard. <laughs> like I'm gonna say everything. And basically, the same thing is happening here with the dragons. See how these guys are all moving to the left, moving to the left right here, but the background is moving to the right. And also the wing and then this little arm back here is moving to the right as well. This is uh, simulating the, the camera turning as well as panning. And it's, it's a little bit of a trick. I, ideally, like if it was a 3D object, you'd be seeing a little bit more of the, the turning of the dragon's head. But you can't really do that exactly in Photoshop. And when you're doing storyboards, you don't need to get necessarily that crazy. But um, the, the thing I want to talk to you guys about today is basically um, like a good, a, good of, uh, a good amount of layers that I think goes into a good parallax animation is about three to four, right? And obviously you can go five, six, seven, you can add a bunch of stuff in here. But really look at this. It's just, it's the pauldron and then it's Marcus and the table and the background. This is an example of three layers. And then I tried to do something with the shine on the pauldron where it's actually moving just a little bit. Like you can see as, you know, I'm trying to like simulate as the camera's moving, like the, the specular highlight on the pauldron is moving as well. But eh, it's kind of, maybe it's so subtle that it just looks perfect. I don't know. But anyway, okay, so then you have the frame mask again. Now the frame mask, what you create with that is, um, or how you create that is, like I said, you have your frame set up, you just do that, and then uh, you marquee it, right? And then you fill it, which is, um, you can either go to Edit, Fill, or you can hit Shift F5. And I just fill it with whatever the background color is, like that light gray. And then when you have that light gray box, you just go ahead and you clip everything to it. And there you have the scene. All right, so now, that's all good information and everything, but how the heck do you set it up and actually make the tool work? Okay, and I, I wanted to get everything out of the way, all the general stuff out of the way, before we delve into the tool. So, let's go ahead and I'm going to create a new frame for you guys. I'm going to create a brand new frame. And while it might not be as detailed as this, this will show you how you at home can make one of these yourself. Okay, so let's go ahead and get rid of all these other layers. Let's just go ahead and delete all these layers, because we don't need this. We don't need these ones. Um, yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's make a brand new thing. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna get rid of the tools right now. We don't we don't need to bother with the tools. We'll set it back to frame zero, and uh, let's go ahead and start a scene. Let's start a scene. I'm probably gonna make it Emma or something like that. It's because I love it. And you want to think about you want to think about uh, foreground, midground, background. Okay, foreground, midground, background. And here's the way that I go about doing it. It's actually quite simple. I don't worry so much about like painting it perfectly at the beginning. Like what I'll do is I'll just be like, okay, I want to get an idea for, I just want to get an idea for something. Okay, so I'll create, you know, Emma standing here, right? Here's Emma. And don't worry so much, like I said, don't worry about separating it into the background and all those things yet because that can get a little bit confusing. I can get a tad bit confusing, but if you want to, I guess you could. You could. If you're really good at that and you're good at multitasking, I'm terrible at multitasking, so what I like to do is I just like to paint an entire scene. So I'll just be like, okay, there's the foreground, here's uh, the mid-ground right here, which will be like, uh, this is probably going to look similar to the promo picture that we did of the zombies. So there'll be like a house over here, and there'll be like some zombies over here, right? some zombie things or just like some crap over there or whatever it is <laughs> some broken down old tanker combine thing I don't know okay so now but what's really important is that you guys understand that you need to paint outside because these are going to be moving assets okay so keep that in mind as you go forward you know like don't be afraid to paint outside like paint outside just go crazy go crazy with it Okay, and then, you know, sometimes I like to go back in and I, I like to just play around with um, 
uh, values, you know, that's basically how I'm doing this. It's like, okay, well, here's the light. Light's coming from here. It's very similar to how we did our thumbnail tutorial. And if you guys want more information about creating thumbnails, you can go check that that episode out of the Kane Kale Show. Okay, so there's our foreground. Here's our midground. And usually what I like to do is think about in terms of as it goes further into the background, it just gets lighter in value. So closer things are darker. Further things away have more atmosphere, therefore they're a little bit lighter. Okay, so midground, and let's go ahead and just make the background on a separate layer. Why not? So I'm going to make the background behind everything, okay? And this is going to be our cloudscape. Our clouds, our beautiful cloudscape. Again, not worrying about it looking perfect. But what's very important is make it very big. Make it big because you gotta you got to be able to move this thing around. Okay? And this will be good because I'll be able to show you how I go about um, fixing those things up. You know, if you make it all on one all on one layer, I guess. Okay, let's go ahead and erase some of this, get some value structure in there, make it look like we know what we're doing. It's very good. Well, speaking of that, guys, I'm really excited about the the Emma Christmas picture that I'm working on. Super excited. I did some sketches in my in my sketchbook today that I'm really feeling good about. Feeling good. I'm just feeling it. Okay, so now what I want to show you guys is say you created a thumbnail and now you want to start separating it. What's very easy to do and the way that I do it once I'm done is I'll actually just lasso. And you can be very, very crude with this. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just like, okay, there's the foreground right there. Just cut that out. Right? And then what I do is I hit Control C to copy it. Then I delete it. And I hit Control V, which now remakes it, but now it's on its separate layer. See that? So let's go ahead and put that up there. Let's go ahead and darken the values on that so it's like really like there's a higher contrast between these two things. And then what I do is I take away this foreground and then I fill in the background, right? Because you have to keep in mind these things are moving. So draw what is it, whatever is behind her, whatever is going to be moving behind her as we parallax this thing. And actually, just as a bonus, just as a bonus because this is uh, kind of crappy, <laughs> we might as well make another layer, like a super foreground layer, because I've noticed whenever I do these things, uh, super duper foreground layers look awesome. So we'll just put like a bush or something. Okay, so there you go. There's Emma right there, and there's the house. Sometimes if you uh, if you do the erasing thing, sometimes there will be like, like as I move Emma, see where I erase right there? See how you can see through her right there? See how you can see through her uh, behind there? What I do to correct that is I'll make a layer behind the foreground. See, this is our foreground layer. In fact, I'll label it. And I just create a layer behind that, and then I'll just very quickly uh, fill it. I'll just very quickly like fill in some color behind there. So it's basically just blocking the transparency, if you will. See, so you can see me painting it in. That way, your character doesn't ha doesn't look like a ghost as the thing moves behind it. And again, you can. What's really interesting is the reason why I erase to make my values is because that's usually how I sketch. But for other people, if you just paint gray with gray instead of erasing to make gray, you won't run into this problem. But stuck in my ways a little bit, so sometimes I have to go back in and fix those things. Okay, so anyway, um, super foreground. Super, super foreground. Oh, and it's good to label these things. It's like FG is foreground. Uh, I do mid for whatever's in the mid ground. And then BG for background. Now let's make a new layer and call it SFG, super foreground. And let's put like a bush or something. Maybe I'll make it buttons. How about buttons? Yeah, buttons will be good. Okay, so buttons will be right here. We'll be chilling here with the, the ball in his mouth. Alright, there you go. And let's paint with the proper colors because we are not noobs. We are not noobs. <laughs> there you go. Buttons is the only thing that gets eyes on this this entire thing. Okay, cool. So now we have our foreground, uh, super foreground. So now what I want to show you guys is the animation tool and how to use it. Okay, animation tool and how to use it. Now that we have our super foreground, foreground, 
mid, and background. Okay, so what you guys are going to do is you're going to head up to this little secret area called window, or window, yes, and then you're going to click this thing that says animation. <gasps> oh, what's that? Oh, what is this tool right here? This is awesome. Very cool. Now, before you get all excited about jumping in and doing your animations, first thing you need to do is you need to make sure that you are in this mode. And I'm not sure exactly how far back this animation thing works. This is the CS3 version. I don't know if there's one in CS2 or onward, if they fixed it or took it out entirely. But I'm just showing you the way it works in CS3. So the first thing you want to do is click this little hidden button right here. Oh, crap, you cannot see that. Okay, well, uh, for some reason, um, XSplit is killing the toolbar, but there is a button right here. It's like a little down arrow and then three lines through it. Click that button, and then it's going to bring up this uh, menu right here. And the first thing you want to make sure you do is go to Document Settings. Okay? So what I like to do is because my computer kind of sucks, and because it just makes it easier to view across multiple platforms, is I think uh, the default is 30 frames per second when you're doing this. I set that to 10. That way it's much easier on your CPU. And then as well as your duration, I usually like to go for, you know, the, my my current duration is see it's set at 4 seconds. And the document is 10 seconds, but you can adjust all those things anyway. But I think 4 seconds is about good for what we're going to do today. Okay, so now that you've got all that set up, you've got your duration, you've got your frame rate set, now check it out. Now you've got all of your layers right here. See all the layers that you made? You've got super foreground, you've got foreground, mid and background. So what we're going to do very quickly, uh, first off, is we're going to um, we're going to basically move from left to right. Okay, <laughs> left to right, I think, or, or is it right to left? Right to left. Um, right to le yeah, right to left. Sorry. So we're going to have all of our assets moving from right to left. So here's a really easy way to do it. What you do is you click this little arrow down right here. That'd be nice if you could see that. See, okay, right here, this little arrow, click it down. And I know this is really advanced, but I really wanted to show you guys this like as soon as I found it out because I think it's really freaking awesome. So uh, click it down, and then what you're going to do is click this little stopwatch right here. And see how we're on frame one, right? This is frame one. When you click that stopwatch, it says, okay, now I'm going to start paying attention to where the position of this asset is. And see how you can move it back and forth? If you hold shift while you do it, um, it'll make it so it's a perfect straight line, right? If you don't hold shift, you can do all this stuff. But as soon as you hold shift, it locks it into that straight line. So what we're going to do is we're going to have buttons moving a lot because he's in the super foreground. So let's start him like right, let's start him like right there, okay? Now let's go to the end of the animation. So this is four seconds into the animation. Because you hit that stopwatch, now you say, okay, where do you want buttons to be at the end of the animation? Let's say we want them right there, okay? And then you can easily scrub the animation. See how he's going to move like that. You can scrub it just by moving this little thing back and forth. All right, so now that we've done super foreground, let's go ahead and take care of uh, foreground. Again, click that stopwatch. And let's have it move from there. Basically, the way that this works is as you go further back into the background, um, the way that you create the parallax effect or the illusion is you have the things move less, right? So things in the foreground move a lot. Things in the middle move just a little bit. Things in the background sometimes move the opposite way if you're doing kind of that, that rotating trick. Okay, so now what you can do is, is scrub this animation. See that? Look at that. See how Buttons is moving a lot and Emma is moving just a tad bit? Very cool. All right, so now let's move on to the mid-ground. Same thing, hit that stopwatch. Beginning of the animation, it's there. End of the animation, we want it to be maybe right there. See, it just moves barely at all. So it gets something like that. Okay. Now, uh, the final thing, the background, I'm actually going to do this thing. Oh, whoops. Make sure you always go back to the beginning of the animation. I'm going to do the thing where we actually move the background, the furthest background, the opposite way. So we're going to move the back of the sky. Actually, wait a minute. Because we made all the extra sky on that side, let's actually move this sky like this. So that's where it starts, okay? Where it ends will be right there. So now what you see, now look at that. Ah, very interesting, very interesting. No. 
Okay, actually, it looks like crap. Let's move it a little bit more like that, because we don't need the sky to move that much. We just need it to move a little bit, kind of like that. Um, oh, that's still a little bit too much. And then I'll show you guys that little frame trick. Still moving too much. That's moving too little. All right. So that's basically it right there. Okay, so that probably looks a little bit funny. I mean, especially with Button's head just like disembodied from the waist down. But I'm going to show you guys next the uh, the final thing that you will do, and that is the frame mask. Okay, so you're going to make one last layer behind everything. You're going to take your little marquee tool right there, select that entire thing, select that background color, Fill it. I have my hotkey set to F4, but you can hit Shift F2, I believe, and that works. Now what you want to do is deselect that. Control D if you want. Get rid of the marching ants. And then you're going to hold Alt between each of these layers, and you're going to clip them back to that frame mask. And now what you have is you won't see any of the extra assets outside of the thing, and now your characters will move and your layers will parallax over top of each other. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you make animated storyboards. I hope that is uh, helpful to you. I hope you guys like that. It's kind of gimmicky, I admit, but it's pretty freaking sweet. I think it's pretty freaking awesome. Like, it's working for a client that has Photoshop on the other end, and you send that to them. And if you're creating like an iPad game, like I'm doing with Pauldron, uh, there's going to be like these parallaxing animations happening within it. So it's so nice to be able to. Uh, just get the idea of, instead of saying, oh yeah, well, here's the here's the idea for the picture. Oh, and this is one layer, and he's going to move like this. You know, just like describing it, like drawing a little diagram, as opposed to just showing it. You just send them the document and say, hey, hit spacebar, see what happens. And then they're able to look at it and be like, oh, wow, yeah, that's cool. You know, and then it just, it's really good pre-visualization. And um, I don't know of any other programs that really allow you to do that. And in fact, I barely knew that Photoshop could do it. Alrighty, people. So before we end today, I want to go ahead and take question catapults. Please cast any questions that you have. In the meantime, I'm actually going to pull up the question log because there are some really good unanswered questions from last week. Um, let's see. Yeah. Hmm. Um, really good. A really good question coming in from Melotha. He was asking, Keenan, do you have any tips for seeing and drawing three dimensionally? And there was actually a there was a tutorial on this a couple of weeks ago about thinking with a 3D mindset. And I really think that to to draw with a 3D mindset or to think with a 3D mindset, for me it has a lot to do with lighting. It has a lot to do with lighting Melotha. And I don't know if this is exactly the best way to show it, but um, hang on. So let's go back to these original ones. And um, I really think that what helps me, what helps me with lighting and thinking in 3D is just understanding that as a as a object rotates around, it picks up reflected light. I think that's just the way to show that the characters have depth to them. It's just showing that there, there's shadow and that there can be like direct light but then there's also reflected light coming from everywhere around the room. You know, ambient occlusion from the sky and all that stuff. So I think once you start drawing that on your characters, your characters will become much more 3D, much more believable. And I really think it's it has a lot to do with simplicity because I mean look at how simple these characters are and just kind of like slap down. Um, but they're still thought of with a 3D mindset and I think it really just comes down to learning about light Taking a look at how reflected light works with objects and uh, just running with that. All right, Aliano is asking. Um, let's see. For designing characters, do you find thinking about storytelling can help visual visualize characters better? Uh, like instead of just a static character, thinking about the plot, their personality, their purpose, who they are. Yes, this definitely helps out a lot, Aliano. Um, for me, for me, it's very interesting because. I'm a very visual person, so when I create the characters for Emma, you know, I, I did think a little bit about their personalities. Like Tank is kind of the badass leader of the biker pirates, and so you know, as much as I I, I hate like the cliche, like ooh, bad guy gets the scar across his face. It just it really looks awesome, right? And maybe that's why it's so prevalent in in those archetypes of characters is because it just looks good and looks really cool. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I think it's it's really cool to just think about the story. And and I find that most of my friends, like my writer David, is the is the guy um, coming up with all the backstory and stuff like that. And he's he's just good at that stuff. And my friends just you know they just they come up with these ideas and they see who these characters and they make them into who they want them to be. And uh, that just comes in really handy. So definitely Aliano. Okay. Uh, final question, and then I will take note of all the other questions that I did not answer today. Sorry, I can't get to them all. What advice do you have? Uh, this is coming from, from Loopy Paladin. What advice do you have for doing your first commission? I just got a request, and I'm wondering, do you have any tips or advice? Yes, that is a great question. Um, I'm guessing that you're talking about like pricing as well as like how you go about doing it, like what's the time frame, all that stuff. I really think a good thing to do is just like understand understand what you're worth and understand that this person is coming to you because they like your style right so basically whatever price you're gonna charge as long as it's not something like crazy astronomically unrealistic they're gonna pay it right because they, they like what you do so make sure you don't a common thing that I see a lot of people do is they undersell themselves or, or they do a great amazing job for somebody and they're like nah I don't need any money and what you're saying is like oh well, maybe if I do it for nothing they'll just really like me right you wanna be loved you wanna be accepted and, and you don't want to be rejected by thinking that charging what you're worth uh, you're not gonna you know they're gonna say no or whatever and because really when it comes down to it guys is like when people come up to me and ask me for commissions I tell them straight up it's like look these are my prices for my work and if you don't like the prices then you know don't don't talk to me don't don't bother me you know if you're not serious like you know how much time goes into making this drawing and really think about that is like this person is paying for not only your skill but your time your dedication your passion if if somebody's not interested in paying for those things then they can go somewhere else you know that they, they don't like you know they're, they're not interested in that so anyway we can maybe talk about that a little bit more on thursday i kind of like that not underselling yourself I think that's going to be a good thoughtful thursday all right guys so thank you once again for joining me live on twitch people on youtube thumbs up if you like it thumbs down if you don't my name is Keenan Lafferty. I'll see you guys tomorrow for whatever Wednesday. Probably working on that Christmas card. Should be pretty fun. Till then, you guys take care. I'll see you later. Bye.